I am going to give a short presentation today and then uh, turn the uh, podium or the, uh, the laptop, I guess, turn the laptop over to Howard for the, we'll, we'll probably take a break right after my presentation so that Howard will have a, a mine will be short, uh, an under, uninterrupted ability to present and answer questions. Um, then, uh, as I wrote in the um, the uh, catalog, uh, there's going to be uh, two more sessions. And as I wrote in the catalog, the next session will be about um, payments on the grid. And the next question, uh, the third session would be about controversies on the grid. Now, when I wrote the catalog, I did not know that I would achieve having Christine Halquist of uh, Vermont Electric Cooperative, the CEO, come as a guest lecturer for the third class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do both um, payments and so forth, financial things on the grid, and something about controversies next time, so that when uh, Christine help us come, you'll know some things and can ask her some questions. So you'll probably get more, a, a fair amount of reading between this class and next class, but then hopefully not much reading at all before the third class. It's, it's going to be a little compressed, but I'm happy about it because I'm compressing it because I was able to get Christine help us to come, and I'm really pleased with that. So, uh, uh, and then of course the fourth class will be our visit to ISO New England. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to have arranged that, but I, I had arranged that before the, uh, the, uh, the class began. Okay, so without further ado, on to about the grid here. Um, so the, the grid is really two things when I think about it. I, I, I've been thinking about it a lot. And the grid is about power and policy. In other words, power is you go over to the light switch and the lights go on. And the grid is what enables that to happen. Uh, if you have a solar panel, some of the day your solar panel allows it to happen, but the rest of the time the grid is what enables it to happen. So I think I can say that the grid is what, how we get power from a power producer to your, uh, your light switch. That's about power. The grid is also about policy. What sort of generation are we going to have on the grid? Who pays for it? And how do they pay for it? Um, for example, well, I'll, I'll get into that later, but for example, RECs are a big issue right now, renewable energy certificates. Uh, they are simply a matter of policy. I mean, the power is on the grid. The question is, how is that power being paid for? It isn't really, a, it's a policy question, a payment question. So our first section here is going to be about power. The second and third session is policy. And the fourth session, when we visit ISO New England, we'll see their control room. And that, once again, is about power. Where the, what, what generators are on, what generators are off, are there congestion fees, what's going on. That is the, um, the Thing. So let me let me give two pictures when I'm talking about power and policy. I'm going to give two pictures so that you can have an idea of what I'm talking about. This is a power graphic. I just took it. I, I asked everybody if they had a chance to look at the ISO New England website, and I just took this screenshot from the ISO New England website. It happens to be on uh, April 13th. It was whenever in the morning I, or early afternoon, I guess, that I decided to take a screenshot. And basically what we have here is we have a, a gold line, which is how much power demand there was on the grid, and a blue line of what power demand ISO New England had predicted for the, that time period. And, and you can see that the gold and blue line, the, uh, the gold line ends at the time I took the screenshot because <laughs> that was it. And this was a, a very mild day in in um, in spring, it wasn't a high demand grid, day on the grid. Uh, if you go to, uh, for example, during the polar vortex, you can see high demand of like uh, 22k, okay, and and even high, well, 20 to 22, 
And in the summer, it gets even higher. Now, why don't we hear about in the summer? It's because there's a lot of availability in the gas, of gas in the summer, and there isn't in the winter. But what I'm trying to say is that going up to 15K is, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's, the grid is not under strain in this picture. There's another thing that's important to notice, though. In the middle of the night, the grid is at 10K, and it's going to go up to 15K. So that's one of the the power issues on the grid. There have to be something, some generating systems that aren't running when the grid only wants 10K and are running when it wants 15K because generation and um, use on the grid must always balance. There is no, without, except for pump storage, there really isn't a way to store electricity for when it's going to be used later. So they must always be in balance. So to some extent, this, is a, this, grid, this picture is also about dispatching power. And this is a po policy graphic. And um, basically, uh, I wrote a, uh, an article for Nuclear Engineering International about the grid. And um, this is part of a graphic from that article. The graphic was put together by um, ISO New England and Entergy Research and all kinds of people, and then and then New Nuclear Engineering International and so forth and so on. So here it is. So this is, the idea is that in order to operate, a plant needs to be paid. And this is, you can imagine this as being 100% of the plant's payments, okay? This is like, the plant gets over the course of the year, it's up here, that's 100%, okay? So what are all the colors? That's the question, right? So this happens to be, I didn't want to get into the whole renewable things because then that's a whole different set of possible payments. This is just a regular plant. This is a dual-fired natural gas oil gas turbine, okay? It's a typical dual-fired natural gas oil co-fired uh, dual fuel, it can use either fuel, gas turbine. So, remember we were watching the kilowatt hour uh, prices on the grid when I asked you to look at that and so forth. That's this. This percentage of the plant's payment is the payment it gets for putting a kilowatt on the grid, kilowatts on the grid. So what's the rest of this stuff? Exactly. And, you know, when you think about the grid, you think, oh, the plants are being paid to put kilowatts on it. Well, they are. And they are. This part is what's called the capacity payment. That's the payment the plant gets for having bid into the capacity market and saying, I'll be ready to put kilowatts on the grid. Okay? And then what's this stuff up here? Now remember, this is not, I'm not even getting into RECs and, and production tracks credit or anything renewable. Okay, what's this up here? This is what's called ancillary services. Ancillary services is basically, ah, I don't know how to describe it. When plants go online, they have to be ready to go online. So you can't have a plant that's just sitting there and it's cold and all of a sudden you say, okay, I need it, and then it's online like that. It has to heat up, it has to get going, it has to, so ancillary services, most of the payment of an ancillary services are for something called spinning reserve, which a couple people in here are going to know what that I'm talking <laughs> No, In other words, they're having the plants ready to go online. Now, a gas turbine is a plant that can go online fast, and so it is going to have, it is going to be called on for more ancillary services than other kinds of plants. It's a, a nuclear plant or a coal plant that raises steam or a biomass plant that raises steam, it takes a long time to get online. It, it's not going to be paid for ancillary services. But just in case you're thinking, well, well, now that I've seen how the prices go on the grid, I've got it down, that's the portion you were watching for a gas turbine. The grid is a multifunctional, multi-wonderful, very confusing situation. <laughs> <laughs> and this is... Um, the grid isn't just a theory, and, and I, this is about policy versus price, conf, power versus policy confusion. I say confusion, in all honesty, 
It could also be described as rhetoric. People know what these things are, but they choose to present it one way or another. So here's two policy versus power rhetoric or confusions. In 2012, Vermont Yankee was still online, but no Vermont utility was buying its power. At which point, uh, opponents said very cheerfully, we don't need Vermont Yankees, we're not buying any VY power. And which supporters like me said, are you kidding? Vermont's still using the VY power. It's still going on the grid in Vermont. The only way we would not use it is if it was off the grid. So here's the difference between buying and using. And a little uh, mini story about that is I remember one time I went to a very fancy restaurant in a ski area, and this was a while back, and, and there was a sign on the thing saying, we use 100% cow power for this restaurant. <laughs> Which is fine. That meant they were paying more for some renewable power. There weren't any cows right outside. Uh, <laughs> so it, that's, a, that's an issue about policy and so forth. And um, Rex sold out of state. So if, if you have a solar panel on your roof and you discover the people who installed it are selling the Rex out of state, is the power green? Well, for Pete's sake, it's solar power. Or maybe it isn't really green. Maybe the wreck is green. You see what I mean? It's the same kind of thing. This is using, this is selling. This is using, this is selling. And, and, and you have, the trouble with it is that people use these uh, ideas uh, as part of rhetoric, which is fine. People, should, people are always using rhetoric and trying to push what they think should happen in the world. But I think one of the purposes of this course is so we can tell the difference between the two, okay? So that we can say, oh, well, that's, that's a policy issue, or oh, yeah, but really we're using that power. And I just wanted a very brief example from my experimental days. I, I was a project manager at the Electric Power Research Institute, and over my time there, I had literally dozens of projects. And I only stopped one project. I issued a stop work order. It was a rare thing to do at EPRI, and it was insulting to the project uh, principal investigator, and it was everything you could imagine. And the reason I did it was this man was very smart. If you wanted to know um, how how, what size carbides would precipitate in grain boundaries of what kind of steel, he would tell you. But I kept, he was put, setting up his experimental apparatus, and I said, you can't use stainless for those fittings. You've got to use a nickel alloy. The stainless will really be attacked by, this, by the material, by the solution we're testing. And, no, no, it'll be okay. I, no, it won't be okay. And then, two, you know, a month later, I can't seem to get it going. The fittings keep cracking. I, you've got to use a nickel alloy. Well, it was clear no good was going to come of this. And so I ended up saying, well, this is getting dangerous. He's got some dangerous stuff going on in here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to issue a stop work order. And I did, and it was very embarrassing for both of us. And time went by, and months went by. Years went by, actually. I left Epery. He was still there. And I read in the San Jose Mercury, Explosion kills worker at lab. And I said, please, don't let it be. It was. No. And basically, the thing is, he had a great theoretical knowledge of corrosion, but he didn't realize it actually took place in little pieces of metal, <laughs> and it could hurt people. And I, I mean, that has always been something I've remembered. Meredith? Yes? What is a wreck? Could you define that? Oh, please? that, you know, my husband said, be sure to be tell them. <laughs> A renewable energy certificate. Now, some states have what's called renewable portfolio standards, and those they write their requirements for using renewable energy in, you must buy RECs for renewable energy. So if I have a rooftop solar, then it makes a kilowatt hour, and it makes an invisible thing, a policy thing, called one kilowatt hour REC. Yeah. And that can be sold, you see. That can be sold to a utility that is under an obligation to buy RECs. We're going to talk about this later. Right? Yes, we are. <laughs> OK. I, I'm, I'm just trying to explain that that is the kilowatt is actually generated. The REC is a policy decision. And I'm, I'm really trying to get that, that going here so that we, 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 can, we can make decisions as citizens 
more readily understanding the difference, yes. What creates the obligation on the part of the company to, to buy the racks? Uh, usually it's a state mandate. Usually the state said, in this state utilities must uh, obtain 25% of their power from renewable sources and they prove that they do this by buying renewable RECs. Okay, 25% of the power must be through RECs. So we will get to that and I assure you that, that uh, it, Christine will, you know, she's actually a utility person so she can, she, she will have more to say on this. Okay. So um, I think we've been through this. Uh, the first section is the physical grid and uh, I, ho I hope that you learned some things from uh, watching the grid. I'm afraid I'm taking up too much of Howard's time. So Howard will probably ask you, what did you learn by watching the grid? Uh, second uh, session were payments and controversies. And I'm going to get into controversies more in the second session so that we can ask Christine some good questions. Um, and at, at the end of the course, I hope, we will have respect for the miracle that's the grid, understand physical and policy issues and how they differ, have more clarity as citizens on policy issues. Now, of course, policy issues affect physical issues too. I mean, but nevertheless, people pushing their agendas will go one direction or another on this sort of thing. We will have met people such as Howard and Christine and the people at ISO New England who deeply understand the grid and had fun and uh, taken a field trip. And that is my presentation. So we'll have a little break now and I'll see this is a new start. Thank you all for coming. I have to start off with a quick, short apology. I forgot my OSHA badge. <laughs> I leave it in my briefcase, which I bring with me, but this morning I only brought my computer bag, so it's at I, home, but I do have one. I'm outfitted with these blanks <laughs> if people want them any time. Well, maybe I'll want to be incognito yeah, right. this. I don't know. <laughs> we are going to talk about what the grid is, how it works physically, as opposed to the way some people think it might work or would like to have it work, or the policies. But the physical becomes intertwined with the policy, as we've already seen and we get into. But it's important to separate, though important to me anyway, to separate those into separate categories. How does it physically work, as opposed to how people might like it to work? <laughs> okay, next. Okay, here's a quick resume of mine. I said I started out in the nuclear navy and was in Vermont Yankee pump storage project, other reactors. My first retirement activity in 2001 was a, as a, an American Association for the Advancement of Science Congressional Fellow in Washington during that year 2001, sponsored by the American Nuclear Society. I was privileged to be uh, posted to the House Science Committee's Energy Subcommittee for that new administration. George uh, W. Bush, and new Congress. Uh, Congress had reorganized the committees to do an energy bill. New energy bill, I hear there have been previous ones. Uh, so the House Science Committee uh, and the Energy Subcommittee had a big part of that. Uh, during that spring, uh, the House of Representatives did its part of the bill. All the people were in to testify, all the committee hearings, uh, wrote the bill, and so forth. Then it was sent over to the Senate, and along came September 11th, 2001, and schedules in Washington changed. And that energy bill finally got completed in 2005. But I had the privilege of sitting through all those hearings, all those discussions, and so forth. So I got somewhat of a feel uh, for the intertwining of policy uh, and actual physical hardware and how things are done. Uh, I can't resist, uh, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Before we get into the, I can't resist the story I just thought of on politics and policy and hardware. Uh, it was Will Rogers, the uh, famous comedian, uh, comedian in the 20th century, talking about the German submarine problem in World War I, when submarines were very limited and didn't have air conditioning. They couldn't stay down very long in the warm waters of the tropics. 
So he was talking to some reporters once. He said, well, it's easy. He says, we just heat up the ocean, and then they'll all have to come up, you know. And the reporter asked, well, how are you going to heat up the ocean? He said, well, I make policy. You know, I don't make these details. So we have some of that. And it gets back to your question on renewable energy credits. Uh, from what I picked up in Washington, what was said, it was an EPA idea, and I'll stick this in, and I think I'm correct on it, but that can be part of the discussion. It was an EPA's idea, how do we clean up the air? What do we do about all these facilities that are putting things into the air to pollute it? Can we make some regulations and can we tell every plant what to do? It's impossible. Said, so what we'll do is we'll let the free market take care of it. We will require within an area, a bubble, say, the New England area, the Midwest, um, as they were going to define it, to have so many total emissions. And if we're more than that, we'll say plants have to do something about it. For the plants that find it economical to make changes, they will go ahead and do it. They will get credit for that. They can sell the credit for that to people who can't do it economically, at least right now. And so then they don't have to make any changes right now. Because we're going to look at the big picture. We only want to get down to pollution <coughs> in the whole area. We do not want to pick on individuals. We'll let them sort that out. Of course, the underlying idea, which gets lost in a discussion, is eventually people who are still polluting because they have bought credits are going to have to do something about it. They'll either go out of business because of new technology or down the road, and they'll have to change it. That's my understanding of the idea behind it. Okay, that was a question from the introduction. What about questions from the study material? Anything in particular? I've already written down re uh, renewable energy credits, but he's volunteered to write down any questions that come along so we can be sure and get them right and get them answered. Okay. The uh, was a various amounts of study material that we've got, and a lot there. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Many concepts and terminology were introduced by that material, which we got from ISO New England. Just to make sure we're all on the same page and clear, I like to go over these. Electricity. Anybody want to give me a definition? <laughs> Electrons flowing, either in wires or in the air, in the case of lightning. Water. What, big pardon? Or water. A well, or anything else that flows in there. Uh, metal in uh, his garage plate. Mm -hmm. Sparky. Yeah, through the ground, right, exactly. And I was sitting in a metal chair, too. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, we're very fortunate you're here. Um, voltage. The pressure. The pressure. You can compare it to water because the mathematics of some of the analysis are the same. It's the pressure, it's the push that causes electricity to flow. Current. Volume, I guess. Volume. Yeah, it's the volume of electrons which are flowing. Okay. How about power as opposed to energy? It's a combination of the current and voltage. Well, Product of the two. It is in, in electricity, but how about power in general? Force per unit of time. Yeah, that's right. It's energy, things being done per unit of time. Uh, how about energy? What's that? That's work that's been done or, or things that have been stored. The ability to do work cause motivation, not over short periods of time. Let me illustrate. Uh, if there was a 55 pound weight here and a pulley on the ceiling, I had a rope and I raised that 55 pound weight one foot, I would have put in there 55 foot pounds of energy, stored energy, and it can get work done, things done by letting that energy come back by lowering the weights just by the same way you do on a clock, by raising the weights or storing energies lots of other ways. Uh, if I use that pulley to raise that 55 pound weight one foot in one second. That is precisely one tenth of a horsepower. Because the element of time is in there, how much work you're doing over time. And in the metric system, it's 70, almost 75 watts. So, and 
oftentimes in newspaper articles and other things, there'd be some confusion between them. And that's not the most important thing. It's important, but not the most important. Power plant will be described as, or a solar field, produces five megawatts of power. All true, but that's not what you pay for on your bill. You pay for megawatt hours, how much energy was delivered over time. And of course, different sources can run for different amounts of time. In creating AC and DC, AC is created by mechanical generators turning, uh, and it's also uh, created by power electronics coming from batteries, coming from DC. DC is created by rotating generators, but also by chemical means from batteries, and also from AC by transforming back and forth. Typical way, here's a cell phone charger, plug it into wall, it's AC to DC. This is DC to AC. Transforming in electrical grid terms means changing the voltage of electric power, as opposed to other kinds in other areas like children's toys that are transformers. But in talking about the grid, transformer is changing the voltage. We all have little transformers in our house to supply the doorbells. So you don't have this higher voltage where people may be in a wet environment. It would be unsafe to have house voltage right at the doorbell in case somebody got into it. Uh, using electricity, all kinds of ways we know about, vital to our society. And one of the big advantages of electricity in a lot of applications and why it was so quickly adopted uh, in our society and throughout the world, starting in the end of the 19th century, no waste product at the end point, as you do using lighting from gas, kerosene, or heating with coal or whatever. No waste product at the end point, so that the generation can be removed from the point of use. And there are all kinds of components in it. Uh, obviously, we're not going to talk about the details of all the different components, but what they do. But these terms do come up. Switches are controls for normal amounts of current flow, as in the light switches. Circuit breakers are to interrupt the current flow in accident situations, where there is more current flowing due to some crossing of the wires or somebody shoving a knife into a socket, some child doing that, something like that, an excess of current. And they interrupt the current flow in an emergency situation, an overload situation, without being damaged. They can be used again. There are also fuses used some places in the grid, and we used to have them in our houses. Fuses just melt or blow out. They need to be replaced. So, any questions about any of the terminology or any other things that came up in the material? Big picture, the grid is a system that has grown up starting since, uh, according to Westinghouse, 1886, when Westinghouse built the first small AC grid in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And it's grown from there. That was intentional. Prior to that, a uh, little bit, there was a DC grid in New York City that Thomas Edison built, supplied Wall Street and got the industry going that way. But later on, it was converted to AC because that is more economical and more practical for the levels at which, the power levels uh, at which electricity was being used then. We'll get into the DC transmission later on. Uh, but it's a system that's grown up to supply electricity all the time for people's convenience and lifestyle, and to meet varying demands as we've already seen. Originally, the grid was built to supply power in one direction, from power plants to the users at the end. Now, as with the solar panels and other things, uh, it's being used two ways supplying power back to the grid from some users, but also back and forth interstate in commerce. Originally, the inter interstate ties 
were only for backup and security, but with the advent of commercial generators, the grid began to be used to actually sell power over long distance and in interstate commerce. And you may have heard the uh, remark made a few years ago, we're now using the grid in a way it was not intended. And that's what they're talking about, using it as a, a marketplace. Questions on that? Okay. It still works, but the size of the grid you need changes. Matter of fact, uh, the engineer for the public service department in Vermont recently made a presentation, I think it was to the legislature, saying, if we're going to have a grid that does all these things people want to do, solar power, wind power, back and forth, we're going to need four or five times the capacity that we have now. But that is a political decision as the technology develops. Okay, this system is a system of generating supply and end users and generators of various kinds, the wires, the switches, the instruments, internal communication within the grid on what is happening not only between people but with the different components. Uh, the ISO New England control room needs to know how much is flowing in some line which may be a couple hundred miles away. And protective devices, not only for damage but for uh, natural events like lightning strikes. Okay, grids we know since the grid is just a system of wires to deliver power, your house is a grid, small grid, has many of the elements, distribution, control and protection in switches and circuit breakers. Uh, doesn't have any storage unless you have to have batteries in your house along with solar panels or for some other reason. Uh, it may have a source of supply if you have an emergency generator, the way we do, you can have that connected. How many people here have an emergency generator? Oh, Happens. Mm. Have you had to use it much or zero? <coughs> when I was, when I was on the power line in his office, I went to have it. I know. I know. Well, we had an outage and we wound up using our neighbor's generator and then I bought one. And of course, Murphy's Law applies. We haven't had an outage since. You know? <laughs> but it's there. It's there. Matter of fact, I parked out here kind of a big white box. It's an emergency diesel generator right up here in the parking lot. Uh, set up for automatic start and supplying power uh, when the grid goes down or the local supply goes down. Uh, your car is a type of grid, but it has storage in the battery. Batteries were originally put in for, for starting, but they also supply the ignition. And you have a, enough energy in the battery uh, to keep driving for quite a while uh, if the generator, called an alternator now for marketing purposes, fails. This happened to me one time I was driving, and that car, uh, a 2001 Subaru, had a couple of belts. One of them drove the power steering and the alternator. So I was driving along Route 4 in Enfield on the way home. Suddenly my steering was harder. And then I looked down and there was that little red icon saying current is battery. Current is flowing out of the battery. So I knew that that belt had broken. So I kept right on driving, steering harder. But you can go for quite some time uh, until uh, the battery is drained. Then you have to, of course, get uh, charged and get the belt replaced. But uh, in that car, the water pump was also driven by the other belt, so the engine was getting cooling. So you're fine. Keep on going. But in my newer Subaru, I checked only one belt. <laughs> but I checked with my mechanic, and I could see it that was that way. The water pump is attached to the engine. So if the belt, there's a safety in the design. So if the belt breaks, the engine will keep on running. You won't be able. You won't have power steering. You won't have air conditioning. Uh, you won't have generation of electricity. But you'll be able to drive. So it's a safety feature. So there's storage in your car battery, same as on the submarines I was on, which had both AC and DC grids. And the DC was there for when the AC went down. Uh, and there were motor generators to convert between the two. AC to supply the DC, 
charge the battery, and then the battery made AC through the motor generators, not solid state electronics on those submarines. Okay. The, oh, what's that wrong? Yeah, well, go back. Sorry, sorry. The, the grid that covers the country has no instant storage like batteries. What it does have is a little bit of energy available in the different generators called spinning reserve. They're not up to full power. So if something goes wrong, those other generators can go up to full power for a short time uh, until more gets put on the grid. We'll get into that later. But uh, pump storage, as I experienced, is in uh, experience. Who was the gentleman that was on California? storage. Okay, yeah. Uh, you have energy stored in the form of water pumped uphill. When it comes down, it's turning a hydroelectric generator, a water wheel generator. Uh, if that's running and connected to the grid, it's providing power and you have all that stored energy. So that's a backup to the grid. If it's not running, it can be started and connected to the grid to provide power. We'll talk more about that when we get to the one I was on, and I'm interested to hear your experience. Uh, okay, go ahead. Okay, here is a map of the U.S. grid from FEMA. It's uh, not complete with the highest voltage. It's a few years old, but you can see the complexity of it, and the different colors represent uh, different voltages. Chippy, yes, the different colors represent different voltages. And you can see where the industrial activity is. Not only there, a uh, little thin up here uh, for that voltage. Okay, next one, please. Okay, here's a little later one with the higher voltages, uh, 750,000 and then high voltage DC, which is usually about a million volts. Uh, and this one shows the country divided into the different grid man management areas. Okay, in New England, we're a separate part of that uh, Eastern Interconnection. Yes. Next, please. It's, before you go, is that map based on one day, or is that a No, this is where the wires run. OK. This is the, and, the, and the different colors are the different voltages. So okay. this, is, this is basically a map of transmission availability um, okay. in different voltages. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and so, uh, for example, there's Texas down there, and you notice it's not got a lot of connections to anything else. Yeah, and, and that, that, that's the way it grew up. Okay. The grid started, as I said, for in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, the AC in New York City, uh, and then the value of electricity was quickly seen. So cities started building generating plants and running wires, and then they spread out into the countryside, uh, and they grew up in each area until you got to the point uh, beginning of the mid 20th century where interstate connections and inter area connections were needed for uh, reliability. Uh, and of course, when you get down to a local area such as where we are, uh, you've got many, many little wires. You can sort of think of it like the body with arteries and then branching and branching and branching into tiny, tiny capillaries. And that's what we have running to our houses. Yeah. It's interesting that that the country is divided up the way it is on that map. Uh, I mean, the eastern section is, is a great deal of the country, including a lot of its industrial base and I guess a lot of its population, yeah. maybe except for California. Yeah. How did it happen that that's the way it got divided up? I can't answer that specifically. But when they came to do that, uh, it was what worked and what was economical. Uh, Texas, as Meredith pointed out, it grew up without the need for many interconnections. Okay, so it's it's managed separately. Uh, when the whole electric grid was practically all utilities or co-ops, uh, was each managed separately. Okay, uh, now with the inter interstate cooperation, the manager hired is ISO New England. He's an independent system operator, operates the whole system, although many companies uh, own parts of the system. ISO owns none of it. They're only the hired manager. The different companies uh, are responsible for the maintenance. Yes. Are there areas that are completely isolated from others? To my knowledge, no. 
uh, unless you have some islands off here or something like that. So there are interconnections yeah. all, all across the country? Yeah. But the, 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 the different areas have more or less interconnections with other areas. Like, as he said, Texas didn't need any for a long time. I mean, Texas go, okay, the rest of the country can go away, but we're okay. Uh, but um, they're, they're not, uh, but on the other hand, I just wanted to, um, as long as I'm interrupting power and oh, so on, forth, uh, I wanted to show one of my my favorite power lines. Uh, everybody has to have a favorite. This is called the DC uh, interconnect, um, and basically it, it brings hydropower down from the northwest all the way to, as you notice, it kind of heads over to, um, to uh, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, it brings so much power in bulk that <clears throat> it's worth changing the AC power into DC power and changing it back again. Uh, and um, uh, Route 5 kind of runs alongside of it part of the way. Uh, and so it's kind of fun to, to say, oh, well, there, there it is. There's the DC intertime. Anyway, <laughs> if you're a, a bit of a intertie geek. So. Which, brings me right to the, which brings us right to the next slide, please, Mary. OK. OK, this is a plan for future proposed DC links. Uh, DC is used for long distance transmission of electric power in great amounts because the DC line losses are less than they are for AC. But as Meredith pointed out, the expense of the conversion equipment on either end, making AC to DC at high voltage and then DC back to AC, and they set the lines up so you can go either way with them, is much more expensive than just transformers to raise AC to higher voltage. So, never gotten said, but it's pretty obvious, you get to an economic crossover point where when you're going a longer distance with more power, it becomes economical to have DC as opposed to AC. Can I, can I just show that for a minute? Yeah. If you don't mind, um, the uh, yellow here yeah. is, is DC lines that exist right now. Yeah, right and, there. And, you know, there's my DC intertie, there. and there's one coming in up there from uh, from uh, Canada, too, yeah. from, from uh, uh, Hydro-Quebec. Uh, but you notice this, this hasn't got a lot of yellow, okay? This has not got a lot of yellow because there are not that many places where you use it moving a lot of bulk power. Yet. Uh, yet. But then, moving along, and I think this was really fabulous of Howard to bring this graph. I wasn't really aware of it. This is proposed DC links for the future. In other words, they're expecting, whoever put this gas to get and graph together is expecting to move, be moving a lot of more bulk power, a lot more in the future. Now, I think, I think that the reason for this, and, and I don't know that, because this is really, I haven't looked into this graph that much, but when you're building a traditional power plant, you basically, for most traditional power plants, you need like a, a rail line and a, and a stream or something. But if you're doing uh, renewables, the, you have to build the renewables where the resource is, where it's windy, for example. And I think that a lot of this is because there's going to be more renewables, so you have to build more of these DC lines. And I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that, is that, you, I, I don't know this one very well. Is that what you know about? No, no I. That's as far as I've gone, as this is a proposed plan. But because DC is for long distance transmission at lots of power, this is what somebody's expectation is going to be needed. And what I meant by all you need is a this or that. I mean, you, you can bring the fuel to a traditional plant. And so you can put the traditional plant as close to the, the load or as far away from the load as, 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 as you think is appropriate. You can't bring the winds of the high plains over to the East Coast. <laughs> what you can do is you can run a DC line from the high plains to the East Coast. So I think this is mm -hmm. part of what this is about. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I'm confused uh, from the last electrical type of OSHA class, I had the impression that uh, when it was first developed by Edison, that the DC lines 
were required a some sort of a uh, production facility within a mile or so, and so it would involve a lot of, of, of plants to produce this, mm -hmm. and that the AC was developed transmitted long distances, but people resisted that at the first because they were afraid they would be more likely to be electrocuted by the AC, which was a higher power. This seems kind of opposite to what I'm hearing now. Oh, well, no, when Edison started out with the generating technology available, it wasn't possible to get to that high a voltage. I see. So we, you had relatively short wires and thick to cut, kept cut down the losses. But with the uh, development of AC and the ability to transform it up to higher voltage, more push, so less flow. So the current goes down for the same amount of power as you go up in voltage. So the line losses are less for the current. There's also more losses because of the AC. So that's when you get to the point where you want to do a lot of it, you get that economic crossover point and you go to high voltage DC. So, but technically, couldn't do the high voltage DC then because we didn't have the solid state electronics. This is only, high voltage DC has only become possible because of electron, uh, solid state electronics. You can't generate that high voltage with a DC generator. But you can change AC into high voltage DC. Yeah, you change and right, back right. again. And back, and back again. again. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, but you're right about the original development. And of course, this is an aside, but it's a very interesting part of the public policy. There was a big commercial dis uh, discussion and fight between Edison and Westinghouse over which was better. You know, because the question was, well, this is great, but you know, how do we do this as a business? Do we build plants and sell people the electricity, or do we build plants and sell them the electricity? Do we own the whole thing? Uh, and then after a while, you got the development of utilities and monopolies, and there's a whole policy thing in there uh, over the 20th century, um, where it was found to be in the public interest uh, to limit the amount of facilities because of environmental impact. Uh, when you had two different companies building plants and both running their wires out to customers, it became too much of an environmental impact, so the political policy decision was made, well, we only need one, but we'll give them a monopoly. But along with a the monopoly, they have to serve everybody, and we have to regulate their rates. So, but that's true of water or anything else, which is a monopoly utility. But that happened with electricity. Uh, and there was this big, Big fight between Edison and Weston makes interesting reading. But, uh, go ahead. Is who, it, who is proposing this? Uh, the U.S. government or? I'll have to look. It's probably the Department of Energy looking ahead, but I don't know. I'll have to look back. Put is, that down. There was a squiggle through New Hampshire. Is that Northern Pass? <laughs> Let's go back to the squiggle through New Hampshire. Is that New, uh, Northern Pass? Uh, <coughs> no, that's Northern Pass is an AC line. That would be a. Uh, Proposed DC line they're talking about running over. Uh, oh no, that, there it is yeah. right yeah, there. That yeah, that one. could be. That could be. Uh, well, what they've also got on here uh, 700, uh, 779 kV. So I can't well, quite see the same thing. Existing lines are not golden. So if they're green lines over New Hampshire, they're existing lines, right? Am well, I right? We'll have to look at, I know the Northern Pass isn't built yet. We'll have to get back to that. Okay, let's go ahead. Oh, okay. Next. I'm sorry. We really can't. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, sources of generation. Uh, synchronous generators which operate at one speed. 60 cycles, 60 hertz, it's called now. Uh, in this country, in North American continent, 50 hertz in Europe. Uh, that was just an initial design decision, and it grew up that way. So that's the way it is. So. When, as you know, when you travel, you need to get different appliances or get a converter. Uh, uh, things that turn those syn uh, synchronous generators, uh, water and hydro turbine, gas turbines from pipeline, cow power, landfill, steam turbines, uh, coal, oil, gas, combined cycle, which is natural gas, 
where the uh, exhaust is used then to make steam, which drives an additional generator, so you squeeze all the energy out of the natural gas. Uh, nuclear biomass, for instance, wood and diesel engines, as we have out here. Uh, there's some big commercial ones that the grid uses, too. Uh, Non-synchronous or varying speed is wind turbines, uh, where the electric output of the generator itself varies, but then there's conversion equipment, solid state within the module where the blades connect to uh, convert the varying speed to one frequency so we can get on the grid. It yeah. basically goes from varying speed to DC to one frequency. Yeah, through the solid state. Yeah, electron. yeah, but I well, mean it... in, in one type. In one type. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's another type of uh, non-synchronous generator where the varying frequency actually goes to the rotating component so that what comes out of the generator is one frequency. Okay. So that's a commercial option. Um, and variable P speed pump storage, which is available and being used in Europe right now, where the water wheel actually changes speed. And it's got uh, variable blades and other things but it's as a, as a matter of economics. And then solid state electronics, uh, generating DC from AC or AC from DC, uh, as we talked about the high voltage line and then solar panels, which put out DC. Uh, then there's another category which was talked about in the training material, and you will hear ISO New England, it's called demand resources. Well, it's not some, something that's being generated it's something that's not being used. For instance, factories or other things which can be shut off quickly under the control of the grid are the same as the grid manager having a new source. By shutting something off, he's got that much more power available. And there are uh, some industrial facilities like electric smelting and so forth uh, where they can be cut off right away and it doesn't really interrupt their operations that much because they you know, melted metal over a long period of time. And that is a value to the grid to be able to have that extra capacity available. So moving over to the policy, <laughs> they get paid for it. Right. They, get a, they get a preferred rate. And when we lived in Illinois, when I was at the Dresden Nuclear Power Station for five years, uh, the air conditioning in our townhouse had a separate control and metering from the power company and they would cycle off the air conditioning for half an hour or so, and then cycle it on again. And we got a preferred rate for having that. And obviously what they were doing, they would have that on many, many houses, and they would cycle off a block here, and then before they turned them on again, they'd cycle off another block and then start this block. And they managed it so your house didn't overheat. It really knew the difference. But it was a value to them to be able to control the load that way, so you get a preferred rate. Yeah. We, we used to have a off-peak meter for our water heater in our house, which mm -hmm. is, I think, the same idea. Mm -hmm. It essentially took that load and put it in a time when there was less demand, and we got a lower rate per kilowatt hour yeah. in exchange. Had two meters outside yeah. the house. Yeah. I don't know if they still do that or not. I don't know either. They do. But, yeah. They yeah. do. Mm -hmm. For our electric water heater? Uh, uh, it's, I think you're talking about a program similar to or exactly the Heat Smart program that they, is the New Hampshire Eversource now. Yeah. It's, it does all, all your heat and your hot water is on a separate meter. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. That's at a lower rate, but the, everything else is at the regular rate. Mm -hmm. I believe they've taken that off now, though. I don't think, because I know houses that had two meters now only have one. Mm -hmm. so. Well, we still have one. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's one smarter. We're still giving us a little well, the electricity still works the same way, but yeah. when you get into costs and policy, then you get yeah. these yeah. things that still work. But they're good policy. Yeah. So um, that's demand resources, something that the grid manager can get shut off to provide extra. So then he has capacity that was going to that available for other things. Can I tell a little tiny sure. story about demand resources? So, um, one of the issues that has happened out of the New England grid is that um, natural gas wasn't always available for the power plants when 
in, in cold weather because it would be used in houses, and so they didn't have natural gas um, uh, available. And so for a while, uh, ISO New England had what it called the Winter Reliability Projects. And basically what it was was it asked people to bid in uh, to be available in cold weather. Uh, and so what basically bid in was um, oil-fired plants in general. They'd say, well, you know, we'll store some oil on site. As a matter of fact, there was a period where the Winter Reliability Project actually paid people to store oil on site. Um, but people bid in for how much you have to pay me to store it. It, it wasn't just kind of a random, hey, you, you're great, I'll give you some money. Um, but I wanted to say that another thing that bid in during the winter reliability projects was big companies that bid in to say, I'll be a demand resource for you. I, uh, uh, Joe over here is, is, is bidding that he's going to have uh, 80 megawatts of oil fired available for you. I'm going to bid in that I'm going to have 20 megawatts that I won't use available for you. And, and, and then they would be paid for, for their uh, participation in the winter reliability project. So uh, as a matter of fact, ISO was, unfortunately, if you, I was watching this stuff and I would say that um, ISO was disappointed all the time at not having enough demand resources built in because, you know, that's bidding in because, of course, that's what they'd like. I mean, they would prefer not to say, we're ISO New England and we pay for oil. I mean, they would like to say, and we pay for conservation, but uh, not enough demand resources were uh, bidding in. When you go to ISO, you might want to talk about that with people, but they're phasing that program out because it was considered to be an emergency program, and it was also considered to be too fuel-specific. Fuel and ISO New England doesn't like to run programs that are fuel-specific. Yeah, we'll pay for oil. You know, that, that's, that's kind of a no-no. So anyhow, but they did it because they needed to. Yeah. Needed the generation. That's the way it works. But then you go to the policy. We don't like oil for some reason. Right, right, right. So that's the story on demand. Everybody with us on demand resources? Something that can be shut off or not started in the first, not used in the first place. Yeah. And it's of value because then the grid doesn't have to have some other generation running. Okay, here's a picture of a steam turbine rotor, uh, just to give you an idea of some of the size of these components. And uh, you see the people down here. Uh, this would be probably from a million horsepower a steam generator, steam turbine rather. Okay, next please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, here's a whole unit. Big uh, high pressure steam turbine here and then low pressure right here. This is probably getting up to the million horsepower class uh, turbines. But where, it, where is the actual generator in that picture? Uh, the generator would, would be right down here. Okay. okay. High pressure steam turbine, uh, low pressure steam turbines that get every ounce of energy out of the steam, and then the generator right on the end. Generator and exciter generator. Can I, can I uh, comment that the turbine is because it took me a while because I'm an electric engineer. Uh, but the turbine is turned by steam and it's turning, okay? Then over there is a generator, and when it, it hasn't got any steam around it at all. It is, it is turning in, in, in usually in hydrogen yeah. and very protected from, from any steam or anything happening to it, and it's got a magnetic field being applied, and that's the thing that's making the electricity that comes out of the wires. The steam turbine is there merely to turn the generator turb the generator ro rotation. So it, it's on, it, there, is that a fair description of it? No. Yeah. yeah it, the, the steam turbine's got all that steam going through it, rotating away, and the purpose of it, and, and, and it has all these <clears throat> veins and and I assure you, as a water chemist, that you have to worry about how clean the water is because you don't want to have uh, precipitates on the veins of that turbine because they will they will unbalance it. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on about keeping your steam turbines good. But then over there, it's connected to the generator, which is basically windings and magnets. And that's what's making the electricity. Excuse me. Are those generators 
generally superheated steam? Uh, no. no. Saturated steam. Yeah, yeah, dry steam, dry saturated. Superheated steam technology is very expensive and very difficult because of the very, very high pressures. Uh, you can get more energy per pound of steam, but the technology to handle a superheated steam is very, very challenging. There have been some superheated steam plants built, but uh, with nuclear power plants, uh, the current generation and the originals can't do superheated steam because of limitations on the fuel temperatures. Even if that is solved over the fuel, and it's being solved right now, uh, for any plant, steam, uh, coal, oil, or whatever, a uh, very, very high pressure steam uh, is a really big challenge to superheat it. Next, please. Okay, here's some, uh, here's a hydroelectric plant, okay? Uh, many, many units, uh, because they're limited in size, really by what's economical to maintain and so forth and build at the time they were built. Uh, this would be a big dam installation. Go ahead, please. Okay, here's a uh, picture of a wind farm, wind turbines, and the associated switch yard right there. Uh, the voltage coming out of the wind turbines would be stepped up uh, so for saving and transmission because this is going to, of course, run down the hill and attach the lines going by. Okay, here's a picture of a high voltage switch yard with transformers. That's probably an AC to DC converter, so you can tell by the length of the insulators. Uh, the air around the lines, the bare wires, is actually a conducting path, so you need to insulate, and you can Estimate the voltage by the length of these insulators. They have really, really long ones and it's higher voltage. Here's one of those AC and DC converters, solid state device inside. These are cooling fans on the side and they're people right there. Big, expensive, well, yes. When, when you show it, clear, can you point oh, out right the people? Yeah, that's <laughs> the size of the people. Right? When, you, when you point out the transmission stations, years ago there used to be a lot of this, well, decades ago, ECMs, is that right? ECMs, is that correct? It was concerned with... Oh, polychlorinated biphenyl PCBs? No, it was, um, people were concerned about if they lived close to them. Oh. And I don't think there was any validation oh, okay. on it, and maybe... No, that, no, that was an issue maybe 20 years ago. Uh, okay. uh, some people said, gee, there's they, electromagnetic it's... fields around the lines. If you're living close, it can cause cancer. Right. Mm -hmm. And the same thing was issued, well, with the cell phones, too. Correct, and before everyone got... Hooked. But yeah. that but was it, raised as a possibility, but it's found that it doesn't happen. Right. That, that's all I just... <laughs> It's not of concern. I never knew. Uh, at the levels you get from magnetic fields there and also from your cell phone. So, right. And as electromagnetic radiation, as opposed to other kinds of radiation, uh, which can be more damaging. <coughs> Go ahead. Okay, here's a local transformer, and as uh, you pointed out, you see these things all around. Uh, I couldn't get some drawings of the local grid, it's maybe a security issue, but you know, why bother? We see, we see these things all around as you're driving down Route 10, you see the Wilder Dam, and you see the switch yard there, and so forth. Those are the little capillaries, so to speak. Okay, next, please. Okay, the other components besides the generators are the transmission wires, towers, poles, underground and underwater cables for uh, really environmental impact. Uh, not having transmission lines. A lot of Europe has underground cables as opposed to little headlines the way we do, but they're a more compact society. So uh, the extra cost uh, wouldn't be as great as it would be running underground cables long distances here in this country. Of course, they're underground a lot in cities and so forth. Uh, transformers to change AC voltage up and down. Again, circuit breakers, fuses, switches, Instrument controls, meters, and communications, and regulating components, which can be part of uh, ancillary services. In AC power, uh, there's extra energy which is stored in a magnetic field around the wires each half cycle. And when that feeds back in, uh, it can cause more current in the line than is necessary if you can compensate for it 
by storing that power sooner and canceling out that power. I, it's a complicated concept, but it's real. I've been racking my brain to try and figure out something in the physical world uh, that's like that, where you have stored energy which can overload you uh, if not compensated for. But I can't, so uh, you'll have to, uh, you'll hear that uh, talk as a reactive power or it, and it's measured in VARs. You'll see that sometime. Volt amperes reactive, which is volts and amps is the same thing as the watts and megawatts, but it's given a different name to avoid confusion. Okay. So regulating components, uh, and we'll see some more about that later on. Okay, here's a picture of the ISO New England control room which you will be visiting. Okay. And you see the number of people there. This would be a normal crew, I believe, because it's manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week, balancing the grid. And you see all the things they're dealing with on their screen, plus other things. The um, information page was in the study material was from ISO New England, and the generators for that uh, time were 350 generators that ISO New England is managing along the normal lines. Okay. Can I make a comment yeah. about that? Um, uh, and that is that basically, ISO New England has a lot of different roles, and some of its roles are what I call power, and some of the roles are what I call policy. So this is part of its power role, that it keeps balancing the grid. How much, uh, it, it tells this power plant, start. It tells a wind turbine, I'm sorry, the lanes, lines in your area are overloaded. Cut back a little, curtail. It, it, it's balancing power. It also has a lot of policy th uh, issues that I'll be talking about where it is um, uh, running the auctions for who, how the different power plants get paid and, 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 uh, and the forward capacity market auctions and, and other auctions. It has a lot of policy uh, control also. But wherever you have a grid, you might not have an ISO New England doing anything about policy. There may be no auctions. It may be completely vertically integrated where the one company down in, in, in some southern area owns the power plants and it owns the transmission lines and it owns the distribution lines and it owns a whole, whole ball of wax. But you're always going to have a control room like this because you always have to balance the amount that is um, uh, generated versus the amount that is used. And for example, when I was up in um, the Northwest talking to some people, uh, I'm so used to ISO New England, ISO New England, California ISO. So they, I'm talking to people in the electric industry about something and say, well, you know, Bonneville's our BA. I said, uh, could you explain what that means? <laughs> and. BA means our balancing authority. But, uh, Bonneville Power is the balancing authority for that area of the Northwest. It is in charge of doing the dispatching, running the dams now, not running them later, and so forth and so on. So ISO New England's control room, something equivalent to it, has to be everywhere. Okay. Yes. Question. Balancing, is that by shedding pump storage or adding pump storage or when you talk about balancing pump Well, balancing it could be anything. For example, if there's a lot of demand, then they'll, you know, an average hydro plant cannot run 24 hours, okay? And so the hydro plant isn't running, say, at uh, 2 in the morning, and then the balancing authority sees the demand is picking up at 8 a.m. and turns on some hydro plants, okay? So that the, the balancing authority in that case is the one who says, we need more generation, you, you're the one giving it to us. But it, it comes from that, it, that uh, It comes from a control room like this exactly. somewhere. Okay. Yeah. And as ISO New England will point out, the local utilities also have control rooms similar to this on a sol uh, smaller scale. For distribution, yeah. but, but not, um, not like not this, the not like no, this, oh my no. gosh, they, they can't. They can't control generation. They, the local utilities need to be monitoring all these different switch yards and what's going on on their local wires. Okay. I, I had never heard the term BA, balancing authority. Mm -hmm. This 
group or the Bonneville is the balancing authority. But it's a really important concept, I think. I'm glad I learned it. Yeah. <laughs> I keep learning. Working, working with union people uh, in construction and startup, a BA was the business agent for the union. So <laughs> <laughs> you have to know what framework your uh, abbreviation is in. Okay, here's uh, from ISO New England, the schematic of the overall grid. Big power plant, high voltage lines, switch yard with transformers, distribution lines, local transformer, and finally the end user. Uh, coming to my house, and I'm sure yours and many of the places in Hanover, you, know, you only have really one line coming in. And if that goes down due to trees falling on it or something else, uh, you're without power until it's fixed. When you get up to the higher voltage level, you have interconnections between switch yards. Uh, in a power plant like this, you typically have lines going out in more than one direction uh, or back up of the grid. That's where the interconnection takes place uh, for backup uh, at the higher voltage. Okay, next one, please. Okay, here's the same schematic updated for. Uh, future really, uh, showing day night, but uh, using uh, renewable sources such as solar and wind and interconnection of the users. And the term that has now been coined is microgrids. Well, they're all connected together. It's a microgrid. So your house is a micro microgrid. But these are all uh, connected together. And here we see a car over here being charged, but uh, coming down the road, uh, with a lot of cars connected, they'll be able to support the grid too if they're connected, as well as being, because batteries can be charged or discharged. So that would be a type of demand resource. Cars that were connected either in standby or being charged, switching back to supplying the grids. And uh, then all these users here in an emergency physically would be able to disconnect from the main grid and be autonomous. If they have some storage, then they could keep going uh, with the limit of the storage. Uh, uh, who was it over here asked about why the solar panels are connected uh, to the grid? Uh, because the power can be sold. Uh, you can be off the grid if you want to. We have friends uh, from our church who built a house that way, completely off the grid, not only for uh, no wires, even for telephone or TV, they've got satellite for that. Uh, but they have batteries which need to be replaced in large 20 years or so for storage. They heat with wood and they've got a propane generator for really cloudy days a lot of time. So, uh, yeah. Your parents can even create a generator out of your Prius if you want to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And rather than having a fixed generator, when the power goes down, you just use your car to generate the power that you need. But I, I know that can be done, but we haven't done that with our uh -huh. our Prius. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, well, the resource is there, so things can work in two directions: uh, supplying your house, but also a car is being charged feed yeah. back to the grid. Uh, and all these resources can, uh, wind, solar, uh, hydro, can all be stored. Uh, when the storage is available, and then feed that. And there's much R&D going on right now uh, to develop large-scale economical storage. We have storage batteries in our cars, devices like that. We have them in submarines, but too big, too heavy, and too expensive for all the houses in the country and in the world. Then you begin to get into issues like, well, how much lead is there in the world? get into those kinds of resources. Physically can work. And you'll hear it talked about it. Uh, many uh, renewable energy advocates talk about microgrids. But for this to be autonomous like that, it needs to be disconnected from the line coming in. So in the event of a grid failure, you would automatically disconnect and then keep running. Uh, we have some uh, friends from our church who just had solar panels put in, and uh, they have a disconnection device uh, connected to the solar panels. They have no batteries, but it shuts off if the grid goes down. It'll only 
supply power to the grid uh, when the grid is there. Yeah, that's our case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, well, with any type of generation supply, since the current can flow both ways, uh, you need to have protection for the lines from the sources. Because if you didn't shut down the solar, disconnect yeah. the solar panels, <laughs> and the line was down, uh, not carrying any current because it was down, uh, the panels would still be energizing that line. And somebody comes along to work on the line yeah. and shock. So, uh, a microgrid is going to need automatic disconnection and then also some means of regulating these different sources uh, to get the voltage and frequency you want. When you're tied into the main grid, that takes care of it. But when you go independent, then you would need regulating equipment in the different houses or different buildings or a substation for the microgrid. But that's the future that's being talked about. Okay, grid management, as we saw in the introductory slides, uh, talked about some, the grid needs to be managed for all these different things. Forecast the load, which includes societal events, things like the Super Bowl. <laughs> The electricity usage on a day like that will be different than on a normal Sunday when a lot of people are all at home doing things. Uh, I remember hearing a story, uh, somebody was in one of the utility control rooms, I think it was in Great Britain, but same thing. And they had a TV in the control room and they were watching this very, very popular soap opera. And they knew it would be getting to a commercial, a commercial break, so they began to get their generating ready. Because when you got to that commercial break in England, many, many people would get up and go in, go to the loo, the John, and then flush the toilet, and you would see the water pressure go down, and they'd turn on the electric tea kettle, and all those tea kettles was enough to be noticeable <laughs> seen on the grid. So uh, when you're supplying power to a large area, you need to take it about those events, as well, of course, weather not only uh, for the usage of power, but also damage. Then you need to be concerned about the maintenance that's going on or going to be needed for the wires, the poles, the transformers, but also the different sources, which power plants will be shut down for maintenance. Uh, and damage from nature, accidents, people running into poles, planes crashing, and vandalism, too. Meredith uh, pointed out to me that uh, somebody in England said, well, we use GLAD, or what was it? No, it was in Russia. In Russia. It was Russia. When I was working on, on, on testing dielectrics, I heard that in Russia they use a lot of glass dielectrics, so dielectrics, so we would, you would call them an insulator hanging from a, um, and, 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 uh, and I said, well, wow, that, that sounds great. Why don't we use them here? Why are we doing all these testings of uh, all these different ceramics? And they said, because the Russians don't have guns. And uh, they're not allowed to have guns. And out, out, out uh, hunters look at our, uh, our an insulator. They, they, they didn't get the deer, and they shoot it. And one of the criteria for uh, uh, one of the dielectrics is the skirts are supposed to fall off. If it gets shot, the little zigzag things fall off, but it maintains its integrity. And the Russians don't have that requirement, so they can use glass. <laughs> I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but that's what they told me. And yeah, uh, yeah. when I was, but I, what I was doing at the time was going around to various places that um, did uh, testing of the dielectrics um, uh, under accelerated weathering uh, um, and uh, and so forth. And. Uh, well, that's another thing they have to take into account when it happens. Uh, then the grid managers maintain 120% reserve for the largest source to be available in 10 minutes. Some people are going to start up or raise the load, and 50% of the second largest source available in 30 minutes. Well, you ask what happens during those 10 minutes. That's the spinning reserve. That's the generators which aren't up to full load or can go into a little bit of overload. You may get a little dip in frequency. If you have a big change, you might get a little dip in frequency, uh, a little dip in voltage, too. Uh, on the whole grid, just the way your house lights might flicker a little when your water pump starts from that starting current. That can happen on the grid, too, if something happens. I just want to say that what 
what Howard is saying, and it's important, and I don't really understand it, is that you have to have different levels of backup. You have to have the spinning reserve that, like that gas turbine that can go on really fast, but then you, you don't want to have gas turbines that are 120% of the largest source of your material that will be uh, all spinning. Uh, so you have, there's a lot of different levels of backup uh, to, to the grid, mm -hmm. I mean, to, to what has to be done to keep it going. Yeah, and we can ask that when you go to ice on the wing too, a little more about that spinning reserve. And what happens in that first 10 minutes? You know, that would be maybe a little dip in frequency and voltage on the transmission lines and being picked up by things that are already running. Uh, and then uh, the sources that they use for generation are divided into different categories. Base load, which run all the time. Intermediate, which run a good portion of the day. And peaking, which run for very, very short times. Uh, and we'll take a look at another curve soon. And also, it must maintain voltage and frequency within limits. And by, to do that, get the right frequency, that actually used to have mechanical cycle counters, which would count the number of cycles every hour. And you're getting to the end of the hour, uh, if there weren't enough cycles, then everybody would speed up a little bit. <laughs> if there were too many, it would slow down a little bit. So everybody's clocks would be right. You know, and for the things that depended on it being exactly six, now it's uh, computer controlled and all automatic, but the computers send out control signals to some generators, not all of them, but some uh, for voltage and frequency control. So that's going on automatically within a small range, and the people in the control room are monitoring that. Okay, as was properly said. Balancing, managing a grid is a con continuous balancing act because of no storage. And there's very little room for maneuver in spinning reserve. Uh, so that is their challenge, to be on top of it all the time uh, and have enough on hand for uncontrolled situations up to a point. That's one of the most important things, I think, that think about and remember in public policy decisions that it's a balancing act. It's not magic. There's no magic storage out there. If somebody does something or somebody wants to do something, and there's no magic way to absorb power. Yeah, let's get everybody to have solar panels. You know, we'll just let the grid take care of it. Well, uh, they have to figure out a way to handle all that, you know, uh, which we'll see in a minute. Go ahead. Is, it, is the New York City blackout uh, applicable to this description you're giving us here? Yeah, we're going to get that in a minute. There's been a couple. Um, this is a thought that Meredith and I came up with concerning the Vermont Yankees situation, but anybody's situation, uh, and the billing as compared to the way it physically works. You can think of the grid as a big bicycle chain that goes around. And everybody who's supplying power has got a sprocket on it. And everybody who's taking power has got a sprocket. And since it's AC and it's going back and forth, the chain isn't continuously moving someplace the way it is on a bicycle. It's just back and forth. So politically, people can make a contract with somebody who's over here and say, I'm getting my power from that guy over here, and I'm paying him. But that is only an accounting phenomenon. It's not really getting power from there. It's the chains going back and forth, and you can't tell where it's coming from. Um, and in the case of Vermont Yankee, when they stopped being paid by Vermont, who were they being paid by? Well, they were being paid by the other people on the chain. If you don't have an individual contract, then you get the price that ISO develops for the chain. So when you hear, oh yeah, we've got a contract from them and so forth, which is, was mentioned here, the power isn't really flowing, that's only political and accounting. And I believe that was done to encourage the alternative energies and clean energies and so forth. They could get individual contracts and sell things when the grid turned into a commercial market from the utilities, from being a utility. Everybody with me on that? 
You know, nothing is flowing from this guy over here to here. The chain is just going back and forth. And if you're paying that guy over here, he's only putting so much into the chain for you to take off. You pay him to put his, in as much as you're going to take. So if you had a, uh, a plant in Canada and they generated electrons, mm -hmm. which they do, is that yeah, right? they're pushing the grid. Yeah, so this, let's take one electron mm -hmm. that went from Canada to Plymouth and then got to my house. If they could identify each electron, would you say, well, that came from Canada? No, no, it doesn't work that way. It's AC. It's going back and forth. Think of the... Think of the power line as a big tube all filled with balls. And when you push one of them, it pushes all the others down the line. Push back, they move back and forth. Move back and forth. They're not moving continuously. They're just going back and forth. It's, it's almost impossible to really think about it, to be honest. I, I, I no, have never figured out AC. <laughs> I mean, you know, but basically it is just moving back and forth. And you can think that some the, the, the Canadians are putting a lot of energy into the system, so there's more moving back and forth, so that more people can take stuff off of it because there's more stuff going on, okay? But what they put on up there, it makes the whole thing move back and forth more, but it doesn't actually send any little electron coming down anywhere. Mm. So what do I get in my house? You get whatever the nearest power plants are to you. No, do I get an electron that comes into my house? No, well, you get well, they voltage, come, they're, they're all there already in all the wires. It's mm -hmm. just what the generation does is what makes them, is pushes them, makes them work. I think of them as a voltage coming into your house. Yeah. You've got, I mean, but you have to understand that as a chemist, I only had to understand DC in order to... <laughs> Pass physics and go on. <laughs> so I didn't have to really understand this. Different from another electrical engineer. Oh, oh, good, good, good. I, I was just going to say I'm not sure we ever really defined AC and DC. We're we're tossing those acronyms around, okay. and I'm not sure we defined them. Okay, and this is a good. I this thought is a we good right. example. Alternating current is just what it says. The electrons get pushed back and forth, okay. and because they're moving. They can generate magnetic fields or flow through light bulbs. And the electrons are there in all the wires, right up to the light bulb and through the light bulb. Uh, DC, you're pushing, they bump along all in one direction, not back and forth. But do I use an electron in a light? And is it used up? No, it's not no, used it's up. It's never used up. Never no, used it's up. energy never is taken used out. Up. The energy of its motion is taken out, so it's not used up. It's the energy of the motion that you're using. That's if, a good question. If you question. actually made the electron do something other than just be in the wire or something, you would be making a, um, a chemical reaction of some kind. You're not. If the electron stays pretty much in the same situation it's always been. It's in that wire or it's in whatever. And, but but the ener you're using the energy that was imparted to it. Somebody put energy, gave it energy, and then you're using that energy. The, think, think of, can I please, suggest please. An, an analogy? Yep. <laughs> think of a really long garden hose with water in it. Okay? And at the end of the hose, you're aiming at a, a, a I don't know, water wheel, something that'll spin. And you go way back, really long hose, you go way back to the beginning and you open the spigot where the hose is attached. That's Canada. Say it's Canada. <laughs> and all of a sudden, all the water in the hose starts to move, right? And spins the water wheel. And then you can shut the spigot off or close the valve on the end of the hose. Same, same effect. And the water all stops. A given piece of water may have only gone a tiny bit down the hose in that process, but you still got your energy, your work done, the wheels spun. So the electrons in the wire are kind of like the water in the hose. The original electron may never get to your house, but the whole pipe moves and you can use the energy. That helps? Well, that's sort of more direct, isn't it, than alternating? This, yeah, this is not about alternating or direct. Um, 
I don't. I don't think the metaphor goes as far as alternating. <laughs> yes, you're right. That's like the red current. But alternating is just it's back and forth, you know. And it's yeah, and what and what does the work is the push. Yeah. That goes into it like the like this bicycle chain that goes back and forth. Uh, it's the push that is of value. So that's what makes this argument that's been in the paper about Vermont having solar arrays and they're selling the wrecks and therefore <laughs> you're not using <coughs> green power in Vermont. I mean, you're putting well, power in. And, I mean, it's it's policy. And it's, not, a policy no, it's a policy. It's a policy. 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 Well, it's you not. know, if you put up a solar array that wasn't there before, there is more green power on the grid after you put it out right. than before you put it out. Right. I mean, it just might be in another state. Well, <laughs> well, well it's not. Or it's being used in another state. No, well, no, it's you're being using used it on the grid. You're using it right there. But what happens is a policy thing where another state is paying to have that put up there, and so they are giving themselves the credit, pat, 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 I just paid for renewables, and so they have the credit for the renewables, which is a policy statement. When I pat myself on the head, I'm patting myself because I think I've done something nice. It isn't actually a physical thing. You can't see what I've done. I'm just saying, hey, that was great, Barry. So they are paying for renewables, so they're giving themselves credit for paying for renewables. But you actually put renewables on the grid. And then there's the question is, if you take credit for it and they take credit for it, are there two sets of people taking credit for the same renewables? <laughs> and of course there are. But that's, that, again, is 100% of a policy decision. Okay. <laughs> we better move oh my gosh, well, we better move on out, guys. Sorry. Okay, quick. <laughs> quick like bunnies. Here's loving the pump storage project where I was for a couple of years on the startup. Uh, at the time it was built, it was the largest in the world. I think it's larger than now. But uh, all that stored energy is in the water pumped up from Lake Michigan. It's on the eastern shore. That dike was built on the bluff above the uh, lake. Uh, that road going around is six on top is six miles long. So it's a big yeah. facility. Uh, this is designed on a daily, weekly cycle for the grid. I'll explain that in a minute. And the maximum power generating is 1,800 megawatts. Vermont's total peak is about 1,000. In pumping, it takes 2,040 megawatts. Uh, this was designed to support the grid in Michigan, Ontario, northern Indiana, and northern Illinois, which have a lot of people and a lot of industrial facilities, uh, which is why it's so large. And, uh, the different power companies in those areas were partners in getting this built. So, uh, yes. So it's taking more energy to pump the water up there than you're going to get out of it. Oh, absolutely. But it, yeah, sure. but you're going to store it so you have it when you when, want it. When you want sure. it, or or store it when you've got excess that you've got to do something with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course. Um, so like the numbers are, you get back three for every four you put in, so you get 75% efficient. If you've ever there is no free lunch in nature. <laughs> if you've ever been around uh, uh, the West, uh, the old, uh, they, they had a lot of this sort of thing in the old days. There'd be a windmill with a, 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 uh, a storage tank. And so basically when the wind was blowing, it would pump some water up there, and then they had water for the cattle anytime they wanted it, and they didn't have to connect electricity to it because it would pump it up. This is a sort of a bigger scale and more useful, well, yeah, but, yeah. but it's the same sort of thing. When we've got the resource, we use it to bring the water uphill, and then we use the resource, when we, then we use that when we need it. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll leave it right in a second. Oh, Just sorry. as a quick example, this daily weekly cycle was designed to service the grid the way it's used. Starting off uh, Monday morning, the reservoir would be at peak level. Generate power during the day Monday to balance the grid, provide you know the peaking power too. Uh, pump, Monday night, pump up, but it wouldn't get quite up to full level. Tuesday, take water down, pump it up. It wouldn't get as high as it was Monday night. And it would go along that way during the week until midday Sunday, when there was very, very little power usage in the afternoon and evening. And then they would pump all the way back up to the top again. Mm -hmm. And that was the daily, weekly cycle. That He's, area, excuse me, that area down below the uh, dam, that's the air, uh, the water intake? Yeah, that's where the water comes in from Lake Michigan. 
No, 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 Northfield? No, no, no. This is uh, Candlewood Candle Lake in Massachusetts. Oh, Candlewood. Sorry, it's north sorry, of Danbury. It goes way back to the 1920s. And then the other two in New England are Northfield Mountain uh, and Bear Swamp in Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, just quickly, uh, these hydro machines, uh, as any hydro machines, take very little power to get them started. Just lubricating oil, cooling water, and a little generator uh, power for the exciter and the and the governor, which can be supplied by a diesel generator, and the instruments and controls are from batteries, so that if the whole grid is lost, they can start up the machines with a, their own diesel and then pick up the grid. Yes? Uh, do they ever idle? Do they have, do, do, does a pump storage ever idle as a, as a you know, so it can be put on up to date right immediately? Uh, they, can, they do come on sometimes at very low power and then they're ready to pick it up. The other feature because of uh, the grid's needs, uh, and this occur was occurring while I was there, uh, they would get paid to be in standby provided they could get a machine on within four minutes. And periodically the superintendent would have to come down and do a demonstration that they could still get on the line in four minutes. Was that from a dead stop? From, from a dead I... stop, yeah. Wow. Dead, dead stop on four minutes online and picking up power. Uh, not like a steam plant where you got to warm up the pipes. You just spin it up with water and get on the grid. Is gas turbine quicker or is that uh, about the same? I don't know. I don't know. Probably a little quicker because it's like open the throttle. Yeah. Well, light it off. Yeah. It's just a well, jet, engine, jet engine, you know, with yeah. a generator. Yes. So it's kind of hard to tell for sure in this picture, and I can see another lake up in the back there. Is this a lower level? No, that, is, or that is just happens to be science? there. That's another little pond that's there in the area. Okay. It's got nothing to do with this. But do they use this in, as a multi-use for recreation as no. well? No. No. Okay. They don't. But don't jet, jet engines have to be warmed up first before they... Well, and they never sometimes. It storage. depends on... Uh, storm uh, if they're designed for rapid start, then they okay. can handle it. It's, it's kind of a rough surface. I'm, 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 I'm just going to comment... Okay, quickly, we've got to finish yeah, up. Yeah, we've got to finish up. If people, it's, yeah. Yeah. Okay, here, here's a grid curve. Uh, this was May 23rd, 2015. Got to be careful with those curves they have because the bottom here is not zero. That's 9,000. This is 12,750. Uh, on this day, this is what uh, solar power did. This is what th they had to do. The dotted line is what they thought they would have to do, but this is what solar power did, although they don't have metering on all the home solar units, only on the large 5 megawatt installations. Yeah. So they're estimating what solar power was doing on that day from what they saw current flowing. Okay. So Go ahead and move on. Oh, okay. okay. Historical grid problems, a great blackout in the Northeast, 1965. Uh, that was a big uh, eye opener for a lot of people who had come to think that the grid would always be there. And they had designed equipment that way. Oh, we'll start up from the grid. But when the grid wasn't there, they couldn't start at all. Um, ISO New England pointed out to us that the recommendations from that. Uh, are still a good read, and they're available online. And, uh, so it's page 43 in the report to the president, and uh, I'll put it up on the website if anybody's interested in reading it. Uh, thing the way where, well, that's now uh, 51 years ago, 50 years ago this last fall. Uh, and it kind of boggles the mind to think how blasé the attitude was back then. Uh, 2000, the Great North Central Blackout was uh, due to lack of tree trimming. Uh, and instruments not able to detect things right away. New England was not blacked out because the personnel in the ISO center did the right thing that they were supposed to and didn't do in 1965. When they saw the grid beginning to get overloaded, they disconnected those ties over to New York State. So New England kept right on going. And then since then we've had storm damage. I have got Lowell Mountain up here because 
when the, that wind farm went into service, they couldn't get up to, they weren't allowed to get up to full output by the grid manager because they didn't have enough uh, regulating compensation there. And the governor of New Hampshire, or of Vermont, was complaining, you know, that uh, you're not taking full advantage. Well, they couldn't uh, until they installed a synchronous condenser. And it was all written up in the paper, not explained very well what it was for. But it's to balance that extra load stored in the magnetic field. So it's a, even though it's tough to explain uh, phenomena, it's a real phenomena and it costs money. Go ahead, please. Okay, here is the way uh, New England interconnections are now. The blue are DC and the black are uh, AC interconnections. From New England can be thought of as kind of, an, it's grid like an island and these are bridges to the other places. I'm sure you'll see more about this. The grid is vulnerable not only to cyber attack now, but sunspot events, storms, accidents, vandalism, human error, and political error. Okay. Finally, in conclusion, it's important to take away the grid is vital to our lives and economy, as you probably know. It's complex. When the grid is providing power, it's being generated somewhere except in the case of minor batteries in your house or something. There is no instant storage, similar to cars or batteries in your house. And the grid is controlled by people. It's not major. It's very complex. Hard to get that from the press sometimes. Those are the facts. Thank you very much.